readings of the first webinar, then we moved to the second webinar, uh, where this time we purposed reach the hard to reach parents, the hard to reach households, the parents in the informal settlements, and the parents who could who had not talked to us in a long time, uh, simply because they didn't have access to things like internet. And uh, we had this this discussion, and they were like, "No, we need something to be done." And uh, not just therapy; there is also the issue of livelihood coming around this time. And uh, the what came out of that webinar is that there was this kind of fear that the children are losing the milestones that had already been gained, that the parents are saying, "Give us su uh, sufficient support. We do not have sufficient support." And out of the second webinar, then. Uh, a memoranda was written and presented to the Ministry of Health, uh, asking the Ministry of Health to treat and uh, recognize therapy services as essential services because the children were losing milestones, the children were suffering, uh, we were afraid that we could even lose some children, and uh, the parents who had so many questions that needed to be answered. That memoranda, uh, to date, at least something has been done. They have responded and uh, they asked that uh, protocols be put in place uh, as a proposal so that then they can be looked at within the ministry and we could get a feedback. I know as a smaller team, people sat down and they wrote uh, a proposed uh, guidelines and they have been submitted to the ministry. We are waiting for the way forward. Uh, the third webinar was born out of um, this thing of trying to say we are as Kenyans have sat in this space and this is what is happening in our space regionally what is happening what could be happening in other countries what best practice are out there that we could copy uh, and uh, that is why we said let us go beyond Kenya and reach out to other people so that we are able to learn from them. They, they could also look at what we are doing and we together synergize and see how best to serve the children that so, we so much seek to serve and also the adults that so much require our services. So here we sit in this third very exciting meeting to have this kind of uh, a discussion. And um, I would wish to confirm um, that my panelists are in the house. Wanjiru, could you please confirm to us uh, that uh, apart from Terra, whom I can see, and Perpetua, whether I have Jacqueline and Bosco. I saw Bosco at one time. Wanjiru, please. Yes, we have uh, we have Terra. We yeah. also have uh, Bosco. Mm -hmm. uh, let me establish. Um, whether um, Jacqueline is with us already. Let me do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, having established that uh, we have at least three of uh, our four panelists, then allow me to, at this particular point, um, welcome Perpetua Omondi uh, from Kenya so that um, she could be able to add far much more than I have said so that the other uh, panelists could be up to date with uh, what we are doing in Kenya. Uh, Perpetua Omondi, as I said earlier, is a practicing pediatric occupational therapist. She has over 10 years of working experience. In addition, she's a board, uh, she's a board member of certified telepractice specialist and has been offering teletherapy uh, services to her clients on the onset of COVID-19 uh, pandemic here in Kenya. She loves to work with children, uh, building capacity for caregivers, parents, and fellow therapists uh, through workshops. And she's been very active, and that one I, 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 I am a witness. She's been very active in terms of policy and trying to influence policy in the different platforms. Uh, Perpetua, kindly take it up from here. and. Um, let us hear what you have for us this afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you, Lydia, for such a wonderful introduction. Sometimes you introduce someone and they wonder who is she introducing me or someone else. You have such a lovely way of introducing people. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you for the Action Foundation. Thank you, Maria, for setting up such webinars. They have been such great help to people. 
And me being part of the webinars and the journey you have taken, I can tell you for sure, this is a game changer in the industry because you are offering solution and you're letting the parents speak. And then you're giving policymakers ideas of what they can do and they can even hear what the parents are saying. Thank you for that. Thank you for also the, action, the, 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 the persons who are in the webinar, people from Rwanda, people from uh, the States, everyone who has come and even participants, I would like to say thank you. So I'll just go straight to the discussion uh, about teletherapy in Africa. So uh, pre-COVID, uh, I can say teletherapy was, was something I knew, but I never thought I would need it as much. So my journey to teletherapy began, began with COVID. <laughs> so sometimes you make lemonade out of something. So I think the COVID had made me rush faster into the teletherapy world. So uh, uh, my name is Perpetua, as you've heard, I'm an occupational therapy. I took a training and now I'm a board certified tele telepractice specialist. And uh, post COVID, that's what I have been doing because the area I used to specialize in is in, in schools and children. So when the schools were closed, I had to find a way of reaching my clients because I, they, they, they make me have a, a meaning of life. We say occupation gives you life. So they made me have a meaning. So I'll start with therapy pre-COVID. So when we talk about therapy pre-COVID, um, the different children in Kenya, because I'll speak from a Kenyan perspective and also go a bit from Kenya, because I also got feedback from therapists around uh, Africa. Some countries participated in a, a small survey I did in regards to teletherapy. So before COVID, the children used to receive therapy in a number of environments. So we have the private and public hospitals, the NGOs, the schools, and the medical camp. So you can see the, the, the scope on where or the environments they could receive therapy from were, were varied and they were big. Then now when we come to post-COVID, we, we find that this number of the places where they could uh, 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 get the therapy services reduced significantly. So you find that some places it was limited to public and the private hospitals and a limited, a limited number of institutions. So the, the NGOs, the, the faith-based organizations, the community-based organizations, some were limited, they could not offer. So when they said no gathering, many NGOs, FBOs closed their doors because basically people gather where they are. The numbers were, were, were still high of those who come. So you find that there was a close of some of these, these, these areas. So for, for me, I was thinking now because these areas have been closed, where do these children go? Because you find like in places before in the medical camps, the children could have gotten assessments they could have been reviewed and they could be sent to centers. Uh, in the FBOs, in the CBOs, if the community faith-based organizations, the children could have gotten therapy and continued service and the parents would get training. So I was just thinking then it leaves out a huge number of children who are receiving care, currently not having anything to do. So what is the solution? Because now what happens? What happens when they when they, when, they, when they can't access. So when they can't access, that's when we now rush to telehealth. We have to think about telehealth. So when you think about telehealth in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, telehealth, as I said, has been in existence before, way before COVID. It goes all the way back in the 1940s. So in the 1940s, there were radiological images that were sent 24 miles. So that was like, the first history of telehealth. So telehealth has been there. It's just that now with the COVID pandemic, it increases the demand for telehealth because as we are told, stay home, stay safe. So when the person is home, they can offer the therapy services from home. When the child is home, they can receive the therapy service at home. So with the current COVID pandemic, and I believe this is all around the world, but I'm sure we'll be able to hear with our, from our different panelists how this also applies in their, in their, the, where they're located right now. So telehealth in Kenya became, uh, became important 
But now it has become important, but now there's a, there, there are challenges that now it encounters. So what are the, what are the challenges that telehealth has? So we'll see that in the next slide, we get to see the challenges of teletherapy. As you've seen, it is quite an interesting journey. We are coming to a place where we are saying we, we need telehealth, but what are the challenges in Africa and I'll also share in Kenya. So there's a difficulty in transitioning from the traditional model where we used to come, the, thera the, the client used to come, they see the therapist and then they go home. Now it is changing. Now the client is receiving therapy, the parent or the caregiver is receiving therapy or instructions to therapy. And then they, they do the instructions or they follow the instructions to help their particular child. Now these changes, the therapist now becomes a coach, but are we all, can we all transition from being a doer to a coach? So now there's that difficulty in transitioning. So you find that even in the transition process, any anytime there is change, change uh, comes with a bit of resistance. And then after some time, there's that awareness created and then now people adapt to the change. So it being a new thing here and the clients experiencing it as a new thing and the parents and the caregivers, the primary and the parent, uh, the parents and the primary caregivers are finding it a bit tricky. So, as Lydia said, parents say we cannot be teachers, we cannot be therapists, I can only be a parent. But guess what? Teletherapy is telling them, uh, excuse me, caregiver, could you please try to do this at home? So you find that also there, there's that shift of, of the mindset that needs to take place for the transition to happen. The other bit that now can be classified as a challenge is technology. We, we have limited access as, as Africa and in Kenya. We have phones. Uh, if we look at even the devices from the survey I did, people say that they used phones. So you find that a phone is, is quite accessible for some. I'm, I'm saying for some, not all. But you find that a sizable number of people have phones, but few have smartphones that are connected to the internet. And now an interesting challenge, someone might be in the rural area uh, and they might have a gadget that might connect to the internet, but now the internet connectivity has not reached their village. So now that's another challenge with Kenya in regards to technology and internet connectivity. The broadband has, the broadband has not reached many areas. So you find that it now becomes a challenge because remember telehealth, we are using technology devices to offer services at a distance. So if these devices are not there or these devices are not connected to the internet, so how is the service going to be delivered? The third challenge I would highlight is the cost. So the cost varies. It might be the cost of the, the sessions that might be charged or the cost of the mobile data bundles course, people have to buy bundles, people have to, to, it's internet. So is it bundles? Is it Wi-Fi? Is it internet? And what is there? So it has a cost. So can, can people afford this cost? So you find that there are some areas they cannot afford the cost. And then also the therapists are knowledgeable in what they do. They are knowledgeable with the hands-on experience. Now, the challenge comes when they need to transfer this hands-on experience through the gadget and they, they get stuck. They're like, how do I, how do I do this via, via the gadget? How, how do I do this via the device? You find they're really knowledgeable, but now the transferring of the experience from the one-on-one -on -one to the telehealth session is, is a challenge. Then another thing is that there are some services that cannot be offered via telehealth. You cannot fabricate a split and send it virtually. <laughs> if there's a technology that can do that, it would really sort so many things. But currently, we don't have anything that can be able to translate what I have made here to the client, even the measurements. There are things like even with the splint fabrication, you have to take measurements of the, the child or the client and be able to measure and, and, and change it and adapt it for it to fit the child. That one, you cannot do it virtually. So 
there are some some of the services cannot be offered club foot management for the young ones this cannot be done uh, uh, virtually so there are those services that people and the, the child with disability has to be physically present for them to receive this care then another thing is that uh, not all clients can be able to access telehealth and you find that it, 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 is, it is interesting. There are some clients who will fit, there are those who will not fit. So those are some of the challenges I would highlight in a nutshell of telehealth, uh, teletherapy. And this applies in Africa. Some of, our the, some of the challenges are specific to Africa, but you find some challenges are, are general to everyone. You find that everyone will experience sometimes challenges with technology, Maybe everyone will experience uh, the, the service, the transition between the physical, how we do the session to the, to, the, to, the, to the virtual. So some challenges are common, some are just special to Africa and I can say in Kenya. But now we've highlighted the challenges. I always say when you see a challenge, you also try look for the, the bright side of it. How do we say lemon, you make lemonade out of lemon? Yes. So there are also prospects of telehealth in Africa. So what I can say is a prospect number one is that once telehealth is effectively done, you will find that it will increase access to therapy services. Because being in the platforms that um, the Action Foundation has, has, has been able to organize on the web news, I always sit and listen at, attentively to parents you would hear parents saying, we, we want services for our children. We really love our children and we want them to get services. However, I am scared as a parent. My child is already having um, an underlying problem that will predispose them to get COVID, but I still want the services. So telehealth now gives the parent accessibility to the therapy services and they will get access because now the parent who's scared Though they might be able to go to the clinic or the hospital, they are not going. So we need to reach out to them where they are to, through tele, teletherapy. Because now if you just call them and find out, oh, how are you doing? Are you able to try all this via the, the teletherapy session? I believe there will be increased access to therapy service. And once the increase is there, then we believe that now the children will not miss uh, to, to progress. They will still try it might not be as the same as, but at least there's some progress. At least the, the, the child will not go back to where they were before therapy. At least there will be something ongoing. It might not be 100%, but I would believe I would take 60 or 50 rather than a zero. So that will be the first point I would like to highlight. I would also like to say that teletherapy increases the parents' engagement. You find that once they're in therapy sessions or are involved in the therapy session, they get to learn more about their child. They get to, 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 do, to do more. They get to know which activities can I do during the week? How can I schedule the therapy sessions during the week? So that increases the parent engagement. And then it offers an op opportunity for all of us to work together. When I say all these disciplinaries, we find that in the, in the medical world, we, we, we are teams. There's the developmental pediatrician, there's the physiotherapist, there's the speech and language therapist, there's the ABA therapist. So telehealth offers this great opportunity because all of us, we are meeting just with gadgets. So you can imagine if we can do an assessment together, we all come together like in this Zoom meeting, we are all different practitioners and we do a virtual assessment on a child. Imagine how productive that assessment would be, how conclusive that assessment would be. The parent doesn't have to move from one place to another, seeking for services of all these different practitioners. And these two will be able to reduce on cost to some extent, because meeting and meeting these different professionals is at a cost in some institutions. So you can imagine if we offer telehealth with all these practitioners all in one room, which at times it is very difficult to have. So I, I see it offering a great opportunity for them, for all the, the teams, people, all the people in the multidisciplinary team, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary to work together. The other thing, it will encourage us and it will push our different uh, institutions, our, our government, is to improve infrastructure. I was in a, 
a virtual conference and I could hear someone saying that uh, they, they were going to their uh, uh, senator saying that she was going to her hometown and she's seeing how they will be able to even offer the, the data services via vans. So in it, this, 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 this opportunity is here that with telehealth, then now it will, it will push for infrastructure building. Now, as practitioners will be asking, I am located in Pwani, I'm located in Kilifi at this place. I'm having challenges with internet connectivity. This person raises it up with the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health follows up with the ICT. ICT follows up with the providers. So for me, I see it as an opportunity for infrastructure building. Another thing it creates is an opportunity for innovation. There was one uh, therapist uh, in Nigeria who was able to create something that was able to send SMS with a lot of details to different practitioners. So it creates opportunity for innovation. Where there's a problem, a solution has to come. And where the solution comes innovation. So I believe telehealth will give us opportunity for innovation. People are very creative. And that, not, that is not limited to Africa. Africa people are also very creative and innovative. Their attends just need opportunity to present what they have. So I believe that our teletherapy will give us the opportunity to have innovations around ICT in health. The other thing that it will bring about is private and public partnership. The private sector will partner with the government in various fronts. I have seen where they, when the COVID struck in our country, they created the, the different call centers. So my, my, I have a dream in teletherapy in Kenya is to have a call center where we'll have all rehabilitation specialists, ranging from occupational therapists, physiotherapists, we have speech and language therapists, we have orthopedic technologists. So I would like to see that if I was to dream my teletherapy world, it would be that where you can have a call center where parents can call at no rate or the, even the practitioners can reach out to parents. So you can imagine such a call center set up. We work together with the National Council of People with Disability. The National Council with Disability brings in data. The therapists get to follow up with the, with the, with the people, with the parents and the persons with disability. Because remember, therapy is not just limited to children. These children will grow at one point and we have also grown children with disability and people who have become adults with disabilities. So you can imagine if such collaborations and such work is coming together, you'll find that the people who receive help will be a huge, huge number. The other thing that telehealth is, is creating is a opportunity for policies around telehealth. We, we had there's a bill that was formed that was a pandemic bill where in case of any pandemic, you will be able to, there's a bill that is, is, is set out or has been created or is in the process of getting created. So now, can we now infuse teletherapy in part of the bill? That Perpetual 30 seconds. Yes, so teletherapy can be used as part of the solution to to what we have, or in case of any pandemic, and Lydia said she wouldn't want to see any other pandemic. In case of any pandemic, it will be part of policy. So by and large, that is what I'd love to share in terms of teletherapy. It is a, a squashing in of lots of information, but I would be happy to share more information uh, in, in any other platform in, or in the chat box, I can answer any questions. Thank you, thank you. We applaud you for such a wonderful kickoff of uh, this particular discussion. Very enriched. I'm still uh, saying I, I would like to, at the end of this uh, sitting, to be answering about the contextualized teletherapy services for, uh, for us in the East African region, uh, considering our many challenges. And um, I'm hoping that when Bosco comes to the floor, that is one of the things he will help us to address. Because uh, when I look at the attendees that we have, we really have people who are coming from different backgrounds, but people who have 
uh, an opportunity to do something, something small, even from their own sitting rooms under a tree. Uh, I can see people that I know that are, are out there to support parents and parents supporting parents. So we are looking for that. You've told us about toll free calls and links. I want to believe that uh, we are noting this down so that if it means that we go to the National Council for Persons with Disability to request for such assistance, then uh, that will be the next stop. We are not stopping until something happens. I want to believe that is our Brazil. That is what we started doing when we started this discussion. I would like to welcome one of the attendees. Uh, first of all, I can see Sarah Deuri's hand is raised up. Please, Sarah, you have uh, 30 seconds to raise your concern. Uh, your hand is up. Sarah? Uh, you would un unmute and ask your question. Okay. As since I can't hear Sarah, and I have uh, um, I have a lot of uh, things to attend to in terms of uh, the panelists. I wish that uh, Maria, Maria, Omare, you can hear me. Um, yes, I can hear you. Um, yes, so all questions, we'll type them into the chat box and then we can be responding to them over there. All right. I, I wish to give uh, an opportunity to Megna. Megna is uh, one of our attendees. Uh, so I would like you to give her a mic uh, opportunity so that she's able to tell us a little bit on uh, what we are discussing today. Why have I picked on Megna? Megna is a consultant and a special needs educator who has relocated to Kenya in the COVID era in the last six months. So I don't know whether she landed with the COVID or I don't, I'm not very sure, but um, since she's a person who has been practice, in practice in India for a very long time, and we know that India is quite advanced than uh, we are, especially here in Africa, uh, we would like to give her two minutes to share with us uh, a little bit of what we are discussing this afternoon. Megna, am I able to get Megna? Um, apologies, Lydia. Um, since Magna is an, a participant, she also can't share out, but um, okay. and I can't add her because I'm recording. All right. This. Okay. Uh, thank you. Understood and respected. Uh, allow me at this particular point to then welcome Bosco. Bosco uh, is from Rwanda. He's a lecturer at the University of Rwanda College of Education. Uh, School of Inclusive and Special Needs Education. Uh, Bosco has previously run a private rehabilitation clinic known as Galaxy Health Clinic. You can hear that word, Galaxy, um, where he then got a lot of um, exposure and uh, expertise. He was also uh, formerly a head of physiotherapy department at uh, Kibungo Hospital, and he has a background in the teaching profession. So this afternoon, we uh, welcome in our midst Bosco from Rwanda to share with us what is the situation like in Rwanda? And as a scholar and a practitioner, what is the way forward for us uh, here in Africa? Bosco from Rwanda, welcome and please say your second name. Bosco? Wanjiru, please sort for me Bosco's mic. Yes, uh, let me do that.
um yeah as we take care of that i would uh, i would like to um respond to a question about resources in teletherapy and i would want to ask the participants to share resources in our previous webinar we have um we had resources uh from uh, sense international so um if we have a uh, yeah, a representative, uh, they can share the resources on teletherapy. Thank you. Thank you, Wanjiru. Are we sorted? Uh, so we are still waiting to, to sort uh, the issue of Bosco. Allow me to uh, respond to a few issues that have been raised in the um, chat. Uh, Christina Mutene says, Yes, she has the privilege of uh, having her children attend to teletherapy during this time. But one of her greatest issues that she struggles with is sitting down through the session and uh, listening and watching her children struggle through it. I'm sure we can see this in the chat. Uh, but uh, I hope that Tara will be telling us something about this. Um, the beauty of a parent participating and encouraging the children to continue with therapy uh, because nothing is easy, but there is not so nothing that is as beautiful as a mother's um, encouragement. It might be paining to the mother, but to the child, it must be very encouraging to see mommy sit through with you and kind of giving you a nod of it is well, just try it. Uh, it, it helps to uh, have the children uh, try, attempt, do a little bit better. Uh, she also says there's the struggle to convince the child to settle down to therapy uh, in a home setup. I want to still believe that uh, from our panelists, we shall be hearing what we can do about those issues of home setup. Uh, but from where I sit, I think uh, Christina and other parents who are uh, find themselves in those kind of situation, just like uh, the rest of us have established, or when we had younger children, we had established a corner where the child was supposed to sit for doing a certain activity or doing some time out. I think we, we would encourage that uh, you also set up uh, a space where when it is therapy time, then we can have therapy, uh, therapy at that particular point. So that uh, children are not attending uh, therapy sessions in, on the dining table, uh, in the bedroom, and they are somewhere in between the bed sheets and you want them to get out. Uh, it's good to create that space, even if it's just a seat. And you make sure that when therapy is about to start, maybe you lay a mat so that we are now shifting psychologically to a therapy session. I'm sure Papetua is almost smiling at my proposals, uh, but I'm sure she will be able to have her input on that. I have not uh, found out whether Bosco is ready for us. And at this point, then I will welcome uh, Tara Robinson uh, from the United States of America. Tara is a pediatric occupational therapist. Uh, uh, who graduated from the University of Colorado State of uh, uh, State University with um, a degree in occupational therapy. She definitely been a pediatric uh, specialist. It means she's a specialist uh, with children uh, matters, but she also has experience with clients of all ages. Uh, she's done medical settings, school settings, and home settings uh, in her work. Today, Tara runs a private practice uh, to treat parents in their own homes and within the community. So yeah, here is a person who had already started thinking without the box of how can we treat people at home, uh, which I think in Kenya is not very widely spread, but it's because of our, uh, our setting. Uh, she says that she has served as a Peace Corps volunteer and she enjoyed her time during that time at uh, Costa Rica. Uh, she also speaks Spanish. Tara, I can assure you that here in this region, we speak English. Please don't speak <laughs> Spanish. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I, right now I work at a school also. It's a school that 
that has children from kindergarten to ninth grade. So I see a wide range. So I, so I do part-time at the school and then I also do part-time through my private practice. And in my private practice where I see children in their homes, I tend to see mostly children with feeding difficulties and with sensory processing difficulties. Um, and I saw my students at school on teletherapy when we started our shutdown of schools in March. So I saw them from March until the end of May. Um, and then I also have continued seeing my feeding, some of my feeding therapy clients. Um, I've continued to see them through teletherapy since March until now. And we have actually had quite a lot of success with that. So in my private practice, I tend to, um, I always have the parent with me in my sessions. Um, everything that I do with them, I talk to the parents about what I'm doing and ask them to try some of the things that I am doing with them. So when I went to, when we had to immediately go to teletherapy in March for every client that I see, I had a lot more success with my feeding clients than I did with my students because my students, I see only the student at school and I rarely see the parents, but my feeding therapy children, the kids that I see in my private practice, the parents already had an understanding of what I was doing. So as I, as I prepared for this webinar, um, in the last couple of days, I reached out to some of my therapist friends, some most are occupational therapists, but I also have some speech therapist friends. I wasn't able to get a hold of any physical therapists, but that was one of the things that every single person said is how important it is to have um, parent invol involvement for teletherapy. Um, and making sure that the parent is engaged for me, I am also a mom. I have three children, um, a 15 year old, a 14 year old and a 12 year old. And I think parents are invaluable. And my take as a therapist when I work with parents is that your involvement is so important. Um, you are an expert in your child. You know what your child likes. You know what motivates your child and you understand your child more than I ever will. I may be an expert in some of the skills that we're working on, but together we can be a great team and have great success for children when we work together. Um, so parents are so important in this process, especially in teletherapy because the parent needs to be there to help and support the child. Um, one of the other things that um, the therapist talked about um, having success was making sure that our sessions were interactive. So I am, I've done a tiny, tiny bit of teletherapy before COVID, pre-COVID. Um, not a lot. Most of it was checking in with kids that I wasn't able to see. Um, but it was a crash course in March trying to figure everything out. And I don't say that I'm an expert in teletherapy, but I think some of the ideas that I've gathered can help other people spur their thinking about what they can do in teletherapy. So I wanted to share just a few things that I did and everything that I, the other thing that we talked about, the therapists, when I reached out to them, one of the things that they said is make sure that you can find everyday items, things that people would have at home um, because it's too hard, to, especially during quarantine to go out and find more things. So I'm just going to share some of the things that I used um, and I made sure that I would go to my house, go through my house, and find things, I wouldn't go out and buy things. I purposely made sure I didn't do that because I needed to make sure that other people also had those things in their house. So I'm gonna show you, show you just a few things. So I often use for fine motor skills, 
um, coins. So I just have some coins here that I felt like people would have. Tell me if I need to move the camera a little bit. That was another thing that I ran into is sometimes it's hard to see the children moving. And so the way that the camera was positioned, I always needed the parents help. So we use coins practicing fine motor skills. Um, I found a lot of games. I found that fine motor skills and visual perceptual skills were, um, I was able to do quite a bit with them. So I have a game called Spot It. I don't know if that is something that you are familiar with. Perpetua, is that, I, you, I saw you nod your head. Maybe you, <laughs> you yes, recognize yes. that game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> So the kids really loved Spot It, where they find matching pictures and then to practice their handwriting. So this is great for visual perceptual skills. And then I would have them write on a piece of paper what the name of the pictures were that they saw. So that was a great game. I also did um, Legos. I felt like people usually had Legos. I pulled out my son's old Legos and had them, we would practice building. So kids that had Legos, I would, um, we would build Legos together on teletherapy. And I'd really talk to the parents about what I was looking for, that I wanted to see them picking them up with a pincer grasp. I wanted to see them pulling the Legos apart, pushing them together for fine motor skill and hand strength. I also found that because I was talking to parents about everyday items that they had in their home, that they were pulling those items out more often for the children to play with so that they were getting some more practice between our therapy sessions also. One of the other things that my that the kids really loved was when I got when I used any kind of dice. They seemed to like anything with there is a little bit of chance. Um, I made, so that was another thing that we talked about is that the therapist ended up making a lot of their own materials. So I made the, I ended up making this roll a sentence worksheet for kids. And then they would get a, a dice. And if they didn't have a dice, I would roll it for them. Or they would, we would write down numbers on a piece of paper and they would tear them apart and fold them up and then choose one and whatever number they rolled or they chose they would for their first roll they would write the elephant for their second roll they would see what word they wrote and they would write sentences and then they would show me what they had written so i really loved any kind of dice games I also had, I had great success with one of my feeding therapy clients. Um, she wasn't eating a lot of, we, we were working on increasing the amount of food that she was eating and the variety of foods that she was eating. I had great success with this little dice that they were all different colors. So we rolled this dice and whatever color she got, she, she and I both would run into the kitchen we were, we were sitting in the kitchen, but we would go and find, um, so I would roll this dice and we, we got green. She would find a green food and I would find a green food. We would show each other what green food we had. And then we would both taste the food together. So that was fun for her. I really found, I really found that the kids, when they were doing any kind of chance, it was fun for them. I really, the other thing I found for some kids, and I noticed that there was a, I think it was a parent on the chat mentioned that they had a hard time sometimes getting the kids to sit down. <laughs> and so some of my, the kids that I see had a hard time sitting for a long time. And I knew that coming in, I knew 
because those are some of the things that we worked on. So a lot of times I would, I would make sure, so I, I'm sitting at a kitchen island in my kitchen and this is where I did. So I'm gonna show you kind of what I did <laughs> is we would do head, shoulders, knees and toes to warm up. So I would kind of back up and we would do head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, knees and toes. And we would do some gross motor movements to start out. Um, sometimes I was standing back there and we would fly like a bird. We would push the ceilings. Um, I have these cards that we would do, we would warm up and I'd pull these out. And there's a gorilla and it says, thump your chest like a gorilla. So we would thump your chest like a gorilla, stand like a flamingo, walk like a crab. Um, and so we would do those things to warm up and get them excited, get them moving so that then they had gotten some of their energy out. They had moved a little bit so then they could sit still for a little bit longer. Um, I'm gonna show you in just a minute because if you, as you saw, sometimes when you show things like this, it's backwards on the screen. <laughs> and so I ended up using a lot of, oh, I shared a lot of, is there a way to enable my screen sharing for this? It says that I am unable to share the screen. Lydia, do you know? Yes, if, Maria. If there is, that would be awesome. If not, I can show. So I use, so the other, th the other thing that a lot of the therapists said is being able to share PDFs. So okay. on Zoom, I used, I used the Zoom platform for all of my students that I was seeing and I was able to find PDFs and I would share them and you can enable the child to color on there. You can enable the child to um, circle things. Many of the many times I would, as we were working on handwriting, I would write on my screen so that the child was looking at the way that we were forming letters. And it was also a great way for parents to see how we were working on that letter formation as well. Oh, there it is. Yay. Okay, let me find my. Let me show you just a couple of the things that I would share. Yes, we can see you. Hey, there you go. So I really loved, I, I scoured the internet. I spent a lot of time looking for resources like this. And there, during, during the quarantine, I found so many resources, people were, developing them and sharing quite a bit. So this right here, I was able to, well, let me check one more thing. So we could share this and then we were able to, so I would say, okay, there is the constellation right there. Let's, cir let's circle it. Now I'm gonna to have to remember how I did that. I haven't done it for a while with my students because we've been out of school, but we were able to circle that and mark it. There it is, there's the, there's the planet. There we go. Okay. And I was able to share my screen with the child and I was also able to share their ability to circle things. So then we would find different things for them to circle. So that was, that was a great way to keep the children interactive. Um, I also had some great, some speech therapists that said they use, they were called boom cards um, and it was, at a website called boomlearning.com. Um, I didn't use them, but 
I had several speech therapists talk about how much they love them. She did say that there were some things for occupational therapists and physical therapists um, through, boom car through boom learning. Um, just a couple other things that they mentioned that were really hard. They said um, any kind of group therapy. So a lot of our speech therapists typically use group therapy sessions um, while we were in school. That was really hard to do over teletherapy. Um, you always ran into um, tech fells. So internet connection, whether they had devices. Sometimes the way, for me, I found a hard time, like the way that the camera was angled was sometimes hard. And some of them had a hard time with printer access. So I always made sure that I had, that I had sent emails. I often sent, um, so that I spy that little worksheet I just shared with you on the screen. I would also make sure that I emailed it so that parents had access to it if they wanted to print it out. Um, everything that I sh would share on the screen, I would also email so that they had access to it at home if they wanted to print it. Um, sometimes we were dropping packets off to families that didn't have access to printers so that they had hard copies of what we were working on. Um, but I feel like my skills as a therapist were stretched during this, during the time that we use teletherapy. Um, and as Perpetua said, like innovation was the key <laughs> to all of this is that you had to be on your feet. You had, I had to have um, probably three backup plans ready <laughs> for my teletherapy sessions because I wasn't sure what worked. And so I would have, you can even see, um, I showed some of the other panelists. This is my, <laughs> I would have things like this. I, I probably have about five different activities right there. And that's usually what I would have ready to pull out if I needed to try something else because the child just wasn't engaged. Um, you just have to be really flexible and patient and persistent. Um, but it was really, it, I'm, I'm glad we, we've done this and I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to need to continue to do this. And I'm glad that I stretched myself to be able to include skills for this in the future. Tara? Uh-huh. Uh, our time is up. Okay, I'm done. So thank you so much for having me. Okay, please stay on and uh, look at the chat, uh, respond to the questions that are arising there. I'm encouraging all the panelists to stay, watch on the chat, and uh, let us help uh, to respond the, to the questions being given. Uh, our dear participants, you've heard what Tara has told us from the US, and uh, we've also seen that uh, it's quite a lot of work. She says, every time you think about um, Teletherapy, you have to have a plan A and a plan B. Uh, for the parents, uh, like uh, Christina and others that I can already see uh, as uh, part of uh, the attending team, uh, we've been told that we have to entice the child, get them excited, warm them up. Don't just move from being mummy, where you said, take your cup of milk, and the next minute you're telling us to go for therapy. There must be some kind of breaks and a transition, warm up, uh, have the children have warm up sessions. And then um, use everyday household items. But as I had said earlier, designate an area where we go for therapy so that we're not doing therapy in the kitchen today, in the bathroom today, uh, tomorrow, and another day in the sitting room. And there's a competing uh, activities going on in the same room. At this point, I would like to welcome our two. I would like to welcome our two other panelists. I'll start with Bosco from uh, Rwanda. Bosco, if you can hear me, I had already introduced you. Uh, your ten minutes are here, Bosco. Okay, that we now. Bosco? Bosco? 
Bosco from Rwanda. Um, Lydia, yeah, this yes. is Wanjiro. Yes. Thank, thank you so much for the wonderful moderation, Lydia. As we yes. sort the issue, I'd like maybe to bring to the attention of the participants uh, some of the things that have been going on in the chat. Um, I can see a few of um, uh, what has been discussed. Uh, we have a few of our questions, and I believe our panelists will address them. So um, we have a question on the software that is used in Kenya. And um, being that the software cost can be an issue in a teletherapy service delivery, so are there existing softwares that are already in use in Kenya? That is, and uh, this is a question from someone in Rwanda. So this is um, about just establishing uh, what is currently in use. And then I'd like also to um, talk about a lady by the name of Joyce. Joyce, we are happy to have you um, in this session, and we are, you have given us wonderful input about teletherapy in the US and now in Nigeria and how um, you know the, the, the dynamics of the differences of uh, how teletherapy is already working in, uh, in the US and now having to adapt that in Nigeria. Also, um, there is a concern that I would like to bring to the attention of our participants uh, that is to do with um, home-based therapy. So, uh, one of the participants is asking uh, whether we are seeing more men taking up home-based therapy provision during this time, or is it uh, still predominantly a mother's domain? So maybe we can have those two questions and uh, before we have our next presenter. Thank you. Uh, Perpetua, I would give those questions to you if you could respond to that. And also, I would like to add, uh, Pierre from Rwanda had also asked about the cost of teletherapy, the therapies and the, and the charges. What would you advise from where you sit? And remember, members, we are saying this is advice. Perpetua? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Tara, thank you for the lovely presentation. I like the activities. <laughs> Very nice. I've, I've gotten one more new platform I can check out for, for work. So I'll go straight to the questions. I saw the one for, I, I, I saw, I, I, I'll also look at the comments also, one of the comments that caught me. I got Christina saying that as a parent, she feels uh, a bit exhausted in regards to telehealth. So yeah, I, I hear you and it is a concern that has come from you and many other parents who are taking up the virtual platform. And uh, so I was saying this Friday on my end, I'll be going live on the Facebook page for, for dynamic occupational therapy to be able to tell parents what they can do to make it easy. Just a free platform where they can come and talk about the telehealth and how they can make it work for them. Then also for Pierre, if I'm pronouncing your name correct, you mentioned about software. So I wanted to find out software, is it platform or software? because the integrated softwares where you can use for telehealth and uh, one that I can say that works in, I have seen working in Kenya is Therap Global. So Therap Global is one that, that works in Kenya, but I'm not sure if you are saying the platform that you're using, is it Zoom or Google Meet? So I don't know which one, I'm not sure which, which direction, but if it is a software integrated system, Therap Global works well. If it is the others, the free versions can work, but just remember they're limited just spend a little bit more money to pay for the paid platforms. They offer better, better, better services and better, better, better services anyway. Then I would also like to address the insurance because they were saying about paying and payments. Uh, we, with teletherapy, the, we, are, we are now working towards uh, encouraging on the buy-in because many insurances I don't know if Medicare was able to, to reimburse in the States. Uh, there was something going on about Medicare and Medicaid being able to, 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 to reimburse. I'm not sure, Terra maybe will tell us. But here, many insurances in terms of therapy, it is very new. So let me tell you, I have not heard of any insurances reimbursing on teletherapy. So in Kenya, we are still, we are still there. So we are, we are pushing at policy level where we can get people to be able to reimburse. And then for, for Bernard, I would like to talk about the private pay. 
uh, the sorry, privacy of the session. Bernard asked about privacy of the session. I would recommend that you do the telehealth session in a room where it is not accessed by others. And if it is accessed by others, mention to them that you are doing a telehealth session between this time to this time, so that now they don't walk in into your session or the client doesn't see people passing behind you as you're doing your telehealth session. So ensure that there is privacy when you as the practitioner, you, you ensure the privacy of the client is at, your, at, at, at the back of your head, even with the telehealth session. As much as you're offering it virtually, remember, we still have to adhere to our code of ethics, our code of conduct as practitioners, that privacy is key. The other thing I would like to mention about privacy is privacy of their data. So if you are doing using a laptop or a computer, you are sharing it with someone, please put the client's folder in a locked, uh, in a safe place. Even if you can put passwords for their documents, it is important that you maintain privacy of your clients. So their information is not gotten by anyone. Yes. Yes, Lydia. Thank you, Perpetua. I would wish to introduce the next speaker. Okay. Uh, we'll keep answering these questions. Our next speaker is uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Jere Fultia from uh, Zambia. Jacqueline is a lecturer uh, and a researcher at the University of Zambia. She is an education, educational psychologist with over 10 years of experience in psychology and development research partnerships and corporate co collaboration, project management, and the university student supervision and lecturing. She's a qualified trauma-focused cognitive behavior uh, practitioner and uh, common elements treatment approach therapist and supervisor. Jacqueline is the president of the Psychology Association of Zambia. Currently, she serves as the executive committee uh, on the executive committee of International Society for the study of behavioral development and is a member of the International Congress of Psychology. Uh, so much more we can say, so, so, so much. But uh, I want to give this opportunity to Jacqueline uh, to address us. Welcome very much. In Kenya, we say welcome very much, Daktari. Daktari simply means doctor, uh, Jacqueline. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Lydia. Um, is it Lydia? Sorry. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. No, thank you so much, Lydia, for the for the introduction. And hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so as uh, Lydia has already mentioned, I am from Zambia. And so my um, presentation today is really just to enlighten everyone on how teletherapy is working in Zambia. I'm not focusing specifically on disabilities, but I will be talking about um, tele uh, teletherapy just very generally based on my experience and um, some of the experiences of my, my colleagues. Okay, so I think um, to begin with, I just want to mention that um, for us, any form of uh, therapy within Zambia, I think, um, has had to evolve, like as is the case in most places. And initially, it focused more on the traditional side of, of therapy, you know, counseling that was given by aunties and uncles and so on and so forth. And then we saw um, during the HIV um, AIDS pandemic that um, counseling became a bit more uh, prominent then. And since then, it really has evolved um, over the years. And um, I don't know, is someone changing the slide or should I? Yeah, yeah but the so, slides. <laughs> yes, um, is someone, will someone do it from there? Or is it something that I can do from my end? Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, we have someone who's operating the slide for you. Okay, all right. So I'll just indicate when I would like the slide to be moved. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, so, yes, so, um, and so we've seen over, I would say maybe the past decade or so, uh, an increase in um, uh, mental health services uh, provision within our Zambian context and, um, you know, the need for additional, um, you know, the need for more and more of these services. However, we do see a lot of uh, challenges in terms of how much people know about the importance of um, receiving mental health services. And um, there's really need to deal with a lot of myths that, you know, when you receive when you receive mental health services, then, you know, you must have a very serious mental disorder and, you know, you're going crazy and all of that. 
Um, but then also there's also the traditional side where a lot of people believe that uh, uh, problems should not be discussed with anyone outside the family. And this really then limits how much access people uh, or how much, um, how much people come forward to receive these services. Apart from that, there are issues of confidentiality that, um, you know, some people believe that when you go to, when you get therapy, any form of therapy, then, you know, you are, um, uh, you know, whatever information you give will be given out. And we always have to tell people that, look, one of our, one of the, the major ethics around uh, providing of therapy is really uh, the aspect of confidentiality. But then also stigma, a lot of stigma for people who receive uh, mental health services, it really is quite widespread. Um, aside from that, I think from the government perspective, there's, there's certainly need for them to uh, promote more, uh, you know, on the importance of, do a lot more promotion on the importance of mental health services, but also be able to provide the infrastructure and the human capital that is needed for that. So currently we have one big, um, mental health service uh, hospital um, and you know people who have you know various mental disorders and uh, are, are they, they receive treatment from there but ideally the situation according to government uh, documents is that each and every hospital needs to have a psychologist and a and and a and a psychiatrist but this is definitely not the case especially for um, uh, places that are, you know, um, rural areas, hospitals in the rural areas, especially. Okay, and also to make sure that there's need to make sure that there is a lot of legislature around, uh, you know, the, the provision of mental health services. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so I thought that it was important for me to give this brief introduction just so that, um, you know, I could then, it would make it easier for me to move on to um, the next uh, part of our discussion, which is really around uh, teletherapy during COVID-19. And so because of COVID-19, we've seen uh, an increase, um, you know, in terms of uh, requests for mental health services. Uh, sorry, I'm talking about access before, before COVID-19. We've seen, as I said, over the past decade, an, an increase in access. And this access has been uh, facilitated by a lot of uh, private practice um, uh, that have been opening up. Um, we've seen a lot of community-based organizations that are actually doing work within the community around mental health services. We've seen the church uh, train some of its people um, to actually uh, provide therapy to, to different audiences. Um, and also we've seen some work happening with the mental health bill, but that's still a work in progress. In addition to this, we've seen that um, over the past decade, there has been an increase in um, human capital in that we've had more and more universities that have been offering, um, you know, psychology or psychiatry uh, as, a, as a course. And this has meant that there are a lot more people that are, you know, um, available to provide these services. Um, we've also seen an increase in conversations around mental health, and this has been uh, facilitated by a lot of the social problems that we've been seeing, especially an increase in substance abuse uh, for both adults and especially uh, adolescents. We've seen increased uh, divorce rates, but also we, we've seen an increase uh, in suicidal attempts, especially for uh, the adolescents. And so there are many of these social problems that have facilitated, uh, you know, the increase in conversations around mental health. So this was, you know, uh, pre-COVID. So things were, you know, improving in terms of um, uh, what, uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, mental health services. Come COVID, the conversations have really, really, um, you know, amplified the conversations on the importance of mental health. And so we, um, as psychologists and org other organizations that do a lot of work in mental health, we've seen, you know, requests for radio programs and, and you know, TV discussions and other social media platforms requesting, um, you know, for discussions on the importance of mental health uh, during this period. And, you know, um, obviously, 
this need and these increased conversations have been necessitated by, you know, the stay home uh, orders that we were given, aspects of social distancing, uh, quarantine and isolation, and the impact that it's had on, 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 on you know, uh, people's livelihoods and people's businesses. And so there were increasingly, people are increasingly feeling the pressure, um, you know, and the need for uh, mental health services. And so because of this, I mean, it's, 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 it's really been, you know, COVID is definitely not a nice thing, but from the mental health perspective, it really has, you know, brought out, um, you know, the, 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 a lot more awareness and, you know, it has highlighted the need for, for uh, mental health services within our, within our, within our context. Okay, so, um, and then when you, when you begin to speak about COVID and the impact on, on mental health, and then, you know, we were then able um, as mental health practitioners is uh, to broaden, you know, the discussion that it, this is nothing new in terms of these problems that people are having. We have them in our, in our day to day, but obviously, you know, COVID has really amplified um, some of these problems that people had either previously neglected or just you know, uh, chose to not see that existed in their homes. And so the beauty of all this really is that it's given us the opportunity to talk about how people can cope and, and not just with issues around COVID, but you know, issues around um, other, other uh, mental uh, situations that might uh, trigger their mental health. And so because of this uh, COVID situation, we've now seen an increase in the need for tele teletherapy. So we can move on to the next slide. And so because of the, the whole distancing, the stay home order, um, a lot of um, you know, uh, service providers then had to move their uh, uh, therapies online. And um, it's, it's really been a shift for many of us. And I say us, myself included, because um, you know, there are pros and cons that come with telehealth and uh, it's really a huge learning curve, not just for the psychologists or, you know, the mental health practitioners, but also just even for the client. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a lot of acknowledgement around the convenience of teletherapy, around the flexibility, in terms of you do it from the comfort of your home, you don't need to, you know, the client doesn't need to move to come and see you, it reduces their risk of getting, you know, infected and it, it reduces the risk for you as well. And so there's, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of disadvantages. Um, but also, uh, some others see it as a cost saving measure, because then they've had to stop paying rent. Uh, because they're not using their offices. So from that perspective, I think that it really has been a good thing. And in terms of the modes that have been used, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, providers are using, uh, you know, video chats. Um, they're using uh, just like talking on the phone, um, client a call, and uh, you can actually con conduct a therapy just by messaging, um, you know, unless you're just doing a check-in, then that's, that's something different. But anyway, um, it's mostly Skype, it's mostly Zoom, it's mostly Google Meet and, and also um, WhatsApp videoing. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's all good that we have these tech, this, this, uh, this technology at our disposal, but then as as has already been mentioned from the discussion um, in this webinar, that uh, there are definitely cost implications um, that might be difficult for both the counselor um, and, and, and the client. Um, and then also for, for uh, therapists that were doing group therapy, um, this has become a bit of a challenge because of the different um, you know, clients that they, are, they work with and accessibility to technology. Um, you know, because of the cost implications, but also maybe because of the type of phones that they have, because not everybody has a smartphone, so it's difficult to have a video call or to have a WhatsApp call in that instance. Um, and, and also because of COVID, um, a, a lot of therapists have, have noted that they can no longer um, do as much work as they used to um, in the community, and this definitely means that the number of people that are now accessing these services um, has reduced because um, you know, the fact that people go into the community. And so some of the, the issues that um, the, a lot of uh, therapists have been dealing with uh, really relate to issues of stress, 
um, you know, stress around, uh, you know, their jobs, uh, possibility of losing their jobs, uh, income, entrepreneurs that are struggling with their businesses. There's a lot of anxiety around, will I get infected? Will my parents get infected? And then what will happen to us? Um, you know, there are issues of depression and issues of grief for those who've loved, uh, who've lost loved ones and, and P PTSD. Um, a lot of the psychological issues that we're seeing within our context. And, um, you know, this is, this is just the beginning because, um, you know, the, the, the numbers have started now to really, really increase and we, the likelihood of seeing more clients with these issues is, 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 is really going to rise. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, a lot of the challenges I have here have already been mentioned. Uh, them being uh, the, the issues of poor connectivity, um, you know, uh, our band, our, our services are, are not that great. So you're in the middle of a, a, a discussion with the client and the phone cuts or the video goes off and it really interrupts of, of, of the session. The cost implications with regard to data, but also just talk time if you needed to port. And uh, fear of using technology, there's a lot of, okay, so um, we're using technology um, Use it on the part of the therapist. There's a lot of learning that had to, has to go on with, with these different technologies that we have. But also, I think knowledge and skills in teletherapy. So whilst you're providing, um, you know, uh, therapy to clients as you would face to face, I think that there are a lot of things that you need to be much more aware of when you're working with clients. Um, you know, for example, via video conferencing. So, um, you know, you need to be a bit more attuned to their maybe or their um, you know, a posture if you can see it, but if you can't, it makes it even more difficult. Sometimes you're talking and then they become silent and you need to make sense of what is that silence? What is behind that silence? Is it an emotion? Is it crying? Is it, what is going on? So it makes it a lot more difficult to actually connect with the client. And I feel like that's, uh, you know, a skill that a lot of us have had to develop because of this situation. And then confidentiality has really been mentioned um, on the group, but just to highlight really, uh, concern for confidentiality on the part of the uh, uh, taking care of documentation, but also making sure that uh, they're in a space where they can work very freely without getting any disturbances, without anybody listening in, and likewise on the other side. The aspect of confidentiality for us, we found, has been really difficult when working with uh, women um, who are experiencing abuse because of the stay home um, situation. And, um, you know, we, we're just trying to get them to talk to them when they are alone and yet at the same time, everybody staying home has really, really been difficult. Um, yeah, and then also working with high risk cases. So um, those individuals who um, you know, uh, are attempting to commit suicide, it's, 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 it's really, really been tough. Um, it's, it's very difficult to ensure their safety when you're doing it online because there are a lot of protocols that you have to follow and make sure that they are safe and there's someone there with them and it can be really difficult to do over the phone. Um, and also there's a discussions around teletherapy. I mean, some of the discussions I've had with some of my clients about their concerns is the effectiveness. Will this be effective? You know, when you're doing it person uh, face to face, it's like there's a much greater connection than there is via you know, um, you know, compared to when you use um, technology. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion around that, even from a research perspective. It's obviously much more effective when doing face to face, but we need to think around as 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 service providers how we can still make um, you know these these sessions effective. And then um, I think an, an interesting point that one of my colleagues mentioned was the fact that, look, we are helping our clients during COVID-19, but we're also experiencing the exact same thing as, as, as therapists. We also have the anxieties that they have. We have the fears that they have. And so the element of self-care is, is really, really important, um, you know, also for uh, us as therapists being able to create boundaries in terms of how am I feeling? Am I well enough to actually work with the client? Should I be taking on more cases? Just trying to understand that and you know, just looking out for our own mental health because obviously we're human beings and we're not exempt from what is going on around us. Next slide, please. Jackie, you have okay. one minute. 
Thank you so much. Um, um, this is my last slide. Um, yeah, so I think that as the pandemic develops, I think there's a lot of thinking that needs to you know, go on about how do we expand um, these services because the need is definitely going to increase as the numbers um, increase and how can we do this effectively using what we have in terms of skills and technology. Right now we have a, a there's in Zambia we have a child line uh, slash lifeline and it's a toll free number that people can call when they need uh, assistance. So whilst this is available to, to everyone it's a free service, it's a toll free, only people who have um, telephones can access um, and, and that's a challenge. It only means that a certain population who has access to technology can actually call in. Um, and, and, and also, I think one major concern is, is really the com at community level that because, um, you know, there isn't a lot of community interaction at this moment, you know, we worry about, you know, the, the possibility of a mental health crisis because people are not being able to access the services that they need. Um, but also, most importantly, I think it's important for me to mention our, mental, our, our, our healthcare providers. I think that they're in the front line. And right now, we're trying to see how we can support our governments to be able to provide them with teletherapy because they definitely need it. So basically, thank you very much for listening, everyone. I've just tried to summarize what our situation is like within our Zambian context, what's going on, what our challenges are. And um, I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jackie, Jacqueline. Uh, definitely, we have uh, a lot of discussion going on in the chat, and therefore, mm -hmm. your your insights will really be required to answer. People want us to demystify um, mental health. I also like that you have introduced the perspective of the therapist being stressed, being mm -hmm. anxious, getting into depression. I would like to talk to uh, the parents in the house. Uh, you feel alone, but we, again, as the service provider, uh, are also depressed and stressed. We also grieve the losses that we anticipate uh, from the people that we have been serving. Then there is also the issue of self-care. And I want to believe that self-care here is not just uh, to the therapist alone, even for the parents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who has taken up the role of being a therapist uh, in the house. You have to take care of yourself. And as one person uh, has indicated in the chat, you cannot purport to have therapy every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday. No, 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 no. You have to slow down as a parent and select the days when you are going to have therapy and the days you're not going to have therapy so that you have time for self-care. Otherwise, you'll also get sick you will get depressed, you'll get worn out, and you will need therapy yourself. Uh, we've been told by Dr. Uh, Jere from Zambia that we also have to think about not just uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, what about psychological therapy, where we have to think about confidentiality, where we have to think about, we are talking on the phone, maybe those of us who are using the phone, but this person is in the house, and sometimes the problems are arising from the house. Food for thought. To my last panelist, uh, Bosco, Shiminyimana from Rwanda. I hope finally I get you now. Bosco, welcome. Yes. Bosco, we are ready for you. Yes, now you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, and we are so happy to have you from the hills of Rwanda. Yes, 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 good. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me, and sorry for the delay. There was a technical problem, and I'm very happy to share with you about the teletherapy for children with disabilities in Africa. And uh, this is a good uh, Think and uh, we thank you for the team from Kenya about thinking about this because it is really needed. If it is implemented, it will be a great chance for, for these people with disabilities. So we can move on. Sorry, um, let me reshare the screen. Yes.
Please continue with the slides. Slide one. Hey. Slide share seems to be freezing. So, um, Wanjiru, can you please share as I work on fixing it on my end? Bosco, you can proceed with the presentation from your end. Is there any problem? Yes, uh, we are fixing it. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, I'm proposing Bosco, you continue the presentation. The slides will catch up with you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. I was uh, talking about uh, the, the benefits about the therapy for children with disabilities because once this is implemented, those people with disabilities will have a great chance because there are many, many challenges about reaching maybe rural areas where accessibility is not good, but once the therapy is implemented, we have the chance to use internet or other means through technology so that those people can be reached easily through partnership with maybe other people in the local areas who can help maybe like uh, local help workers and the other people can contribute to help people with disabilities. Yes, proceed. Uh, yes, can you go, go on with slides? So if you can't go, with, go on with slides, let's use another, okay, that's good. Thank you very much. So for my presentation, I started by defining uh, what is the therapy. The therapy is an, an online therapy which is delivered through live video conferencing. And uh, some examples including doing a therapy session over the phone, having a group of chat for a group of therapy, using video conferencing for individual, couples or group therapy, receiving therapy via email or instant messages, so this is very good because you do not need to move from your place to another place. And those people are serving, they not also need to move from their place to come to see you. So once this is implemented, it will be giving more chance to people with disabilities because they will be having you without using much image. So this will be a very important action once it is implemented. Thank you. Let's continue. So What's called prefer you, you continue talking uh, from your side. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's continue. So chances are there and uh, I can also talk about benefits of teletherapy. Teletherapy has many benefits because once you use teletherapy, there is, the cost is low because you do not need to use, to, to use a lot of much money because first of all, you don't need to maybe to hire offices you don't need to travel from your home to the offices. You people who will be coming to see you will not do you use those that, those means because they will stay at home and you will serve them using internet. So another chance is what people will not wait for a long time because uh, patients or clients will not need to come and uh, wait for a long time. Because once you schedule the timetable to serve them, they will be served at time and your work will be great because you will not be pushed to see many people around you. Then maybe think I can start with this one. Maybe someone is calling you. 
but you will be serving someone at right way. That's another chance. Another chance is that the, the spread of disease will be minimized. If you think about the COVID-19 in these days, people will not meet. Once they don't meet, transmission of disease will be also minimized. That will be very important because for you, you will be protected. Also, you will be protecting people with disabilities or other people around you. Another chance is about uh, privacy about uh, patients because some patients may be not be being stable about coming to hospital, meeting a lot of people, depending on the problems. But uh, when they are treated from the homes, they will be very happy because the privacy will be given a chance. That will be very good for them. So thank you very much for coming back with slides. So let me start by the current situation in Rwanda in regard to access and provision of therapy services. This kind of therapy did not happen in Rwanda unless in telemedicine, but for treatment of children with disabilities, it has just started during this period of lockdown from COVID-19. And it has been initiated by an NGO which is called Humanity and Inclusion, former Handicap International, supporting therapy, therapy for children with disabilities in five districts out of 30 in Rwanda. And the, the, technology, the technology used now is called Physiotech. So as you understand, it just started and it serves just few centers or the habitation centers because there are five out of 30. And those files also, they are one in one district. So meaning that we still need to do a lot of things, but this is the chance if they have started. So there is a great chance of uh, doing more. And the, the recent news or information I have, people are still struggling about implementing this action here in Rwanda. Mostly about the parents and the clients, they have a lot of problems of connecting to this website or this platform which can help them because they don't have, many of them don't have means. They have problems of smartphones or computers. They have problems of connections. And the, some of them, they don't know even how to open or to go on about the op opening and go through uh, the process of opening and the searching maybe exercise or information given by therapist. That's another, another barrier now. In the, as you know, some parents do not even know to read and to write. That is another problem. So now it has started and still we, have, we are struggling to implement it. Maybe you hope with time, really, maybe evaluate it and the, with these discussions. So later we'll have a great chance of maybe uh, helping people with disabilities, most children with disabilities in Rwanda using teletherapy. So move to the, to the other slide. So we have a lot of benefits and uh, I was talking uh, about them. A lot of benefits are they are and the benefits for clients, the benefits from clients, there is a greater access to care and low barrier to entry. Here, people, they have greater access to care because they stay home and all of them can be, can access to care once they are connected. And the low barrier is about, they, they are not, there is no barriers to entry because they do not need to move from home to hospital where they can meet many problems in it maybe slow from home to hospital or to rehabilitation center, they will be served at right way and the greater chance of being served or being treated will be high. So the law, there is also the chance of receiving therapy by, at low cost because 
removing all those problems related to transportation and the other means they need through from home to hospital and from hospital to back, back home. So maybe they will be paying uh, low, low money considering to the former ways of treatment, the face-to-face. -face. So there will be more privacy as I was talking about it, because if I'm at home, if I'm a person with disability and I'm at home, and I'm being offered a treatment from, from internet or from other means of electronic way, so I will be happy and being safe and if, and if, because I will be in my home where I will be highly having my privacy. No one will be violating my privacy. That will be very good for people who, who need more privacy. And the, another chance, another chance is about better health care because this is about protecting people and also protecting yourself. About better health care, people will not be infecting other and they also will not be infected because we will not be going in the public area so that they will be protected and the other will also will be protecting others from maybe contamination of this like in these days we have COVID-19. So waiting time will be reduced because we will not need to wait for a long time. If there is a queue at hospital or at the rehabilitation center, I will have to wait maybe five persons in front of me or 10. So once I'm at home and uh, the appointment is respected, I will not need to wait for a long time to get treatment. So there will be also improved access to facilities like full drinks and, uh, and so on. Because once I'm uh, at home and uh, having a child with disabilities who may need other support like food or drinks, I will find them quickly. I will not need to go out in the stop uh, therapy for a long time. It will be taking maybe a few minutes or just few time, not for a long time. Let's move to another slide. So I was talking about uh, benefits about clients, now we have also benefits for therapists. The first benefit is increased ability to reach more clients in the, there will be the cost of service delivery. Once we use the therapy, we will use, we will reach more clients. Children with disabilities will be reached with a big number because we will not need to move. We will be there connecting people from different places and we'll be scheduling a timetable which can serve more uh, people or children with disabilities. There will be reduced cost of service delivery because I will not need to move from home to a rehabilitation center and back from rehabilitation center to my home. So that uh, cost from home to rehabilitation center and the other means which will be needed in that, in that way will not be necessary. I will not need also maybe to hire maybe an expensive office, which will be, may, may also cost uh, a lot. So that will help us also to serve or give service to many people because the, the cost will not be high. So there will be also increased access to own facilities. So. I will have to use my own facilities, not using maybe facilities from my other people. Maybe if I'm in a rehabilitation center, I may need to use some facilities from rehabilitation center. But when I'm in my office, this also can be done from my home. So I will have to use my own facilities and develop them. There may be innovation about which facilities can, can I try to use basing on the character of different peoples. So I don't need to use those facilities manufacture, manufactured from maybe industries. I will have to use some facilities I can find at home. If it is a cup, I can use it to initiate it because I know in every home there is a cup. 
if it is maybe a pillow, I can use it maybe to help children maybe who need maybe uh, troll and so on. So I will have to think about which facilities, which uh, baby equipments can I use from my home, maybe transfer them to different homes, depending on uh, which area I'm working on. Because rural areas and the urban areas will not be the same. Also, they don't have also, uh, they don't use the same things, okay? So the third one will be decreased the miscommunication. Because sometimes uh, you tell people uh, with disabilities or parents who have children with disabilities, you, you discuss them about maybe the appointment. Sometimes they are confused depending on the knowledge of implementing something you have discussed on. So they, they not respond to the communicated the, the appointment or also they can delay to come. So at using teletherapy, it will be very important because once you call them, you remind them at this time you, we have an appointment for teletherapy, they will respond it because they will not need to come for another day or for not coming because maybe they are confused about the scheduled time for treatment. So. Another benefit for therapists will be increased employment opportunities for special population therapists. Here I wanted to mention it because there are some people with disabilities who work in a, in a therapy. So, or we can also give an, a, a, an example of a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman may be finding difficult to move from home or to another area or maybe finding uncomfortable a place where she works. But once she, she will be choosing a best area where she can deliver therapy by using teletherapy, that will be great because she will not be uh, feeling uncomfortable. So that's another issue which is very good. So exposure to illness will be diminished as I, I was discussing just for clients. Also What's exposure good? to illness, yes. Bosco, please summarize now. We are running out of time. Yes, good. So challenges, we have many challenges. There is technical difficulties. As you know, sometimes the internet connection is a problem. Lack or bad internet connection, as I mentioned. Lack of smartphones or computers. Many of, our, of African people do not have computers or phones. And some of them who have them, they just use them for calling and responding. They don't use for these means of internet or other means of video conferencing. So communication difficulties may be there, therapy environment which cannot allow client privacy. So this I wanted to mention, so people who live maybe in one room or two rooms with a lot of people, so they may be having a problem of privacy because they not they may not find a good place for these therapy treatments. So communication barrier can be there depending on who you are giving treatment. So if we use the therapy, I can maybe offer therapy from Rwanda, offering a therapy to maybe a Kenyan woman or, or, or man. So if I'm helping her or his children, maybe maybe finding problem if they can't speak the language I use, okay? So ethical and legal issues is also another problem because therapy need also to consider it ethical and legal issues. Insurance companies may not cover therapy. This is a big problem because whatever we will be doing, maybe all other people will be doing by therapy, they need also to be paid. Companies, many companies may not uh, pay this therapy. So that can also be a barrier to implementation of this problem. So uh, we hope through discussions also this can be sort of so, sorted out. So this can well not be appropriate for serious or multiple disabled children because some children who need a lot of care and they who need their attention. So some parents or other caregivers may not be familiar or able to handle those problems. So in some situation, this cannot be applied to those persons. Okay, let's move on. OK, 
Can we move on, please? Yes. Now we can see about prospects of the therapy for children with disabilities in Africa. So, as we know, for future, we need to do the therapy for children with disabilities in Africa because there is a great chance to help them. So we, we, we have to start by raising awareness. This is very important because we need, even as it's, it's new, we need to know about it and also help other people to know about it. Maybe parents and the community and other people may be involved in this action. So elaboration of guidelines, laws and regulation is also is something very important to think about it because we can't do this without regulation in the uh, laws and the guidelines. Government support will be very important because in some areas where people can't find maybe telephones and computers, government can support a lot by uh, through raising awareness, through maybe opening some centers where the computers and internet connection may be there. So those people can meet there they, so they can serve in those areas. So payment modalities must be also be de determined because this action will be might be paid because it will not be for free. So we have to think about also about payment modalities, how will be it be? Mobilization of private insurance companies to cover therapy is also something very important. We have to think it and they also start if uh, this thera 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 therapy will be implemented. We have to think about discussing about private companies about covering this therapy. We have also to think, to think about personal, who will deliver, because all of the, the, the workers will not be involved in this action. So we have to think about these people, how to train them, how to help them to know about helping or giving therapy in this way. Distribution of basic equipment also is something very important. You have to think about how people have been trained, maybe who will be based in a village or at the centers, how equipment will be reaching them. It's very important because those are some things which may be found in those centers. So once they need something new, or once we have something new, how will be reaching them? Trainings. Training is very, will be also very important about caregivers, community health workers, because whatever we'll be doing, we have to think a lot about community health workers. They are the one who helps a lot in helping people with disabilities, most children with disabilities. So they need more trainings, they need to be more involved in these activities, and also caregivers, because they are the one who will be taking a part as, as intermediate between a therapist and the children with disabilities. So they need also to be trained to be, to be able to help also to be able to understand what we are telling them to do. Because if they can't do it in the right way, it will be another problem. So this is very important. So method of treatment also, we need to think about it. This is very important because whatever we do as therapists, we not be the, in, the way we want it to not be in the way people or who help children with disabilities they will do it. So we have to think about uh, how to guide them, how to give them information which are really clear so that they do whatever you do, you, you tell them. So we have also to think about uh, having maybe more than one person in, in your contact. Once you lose maybe the contact to one person, you find another one because you may be having an appointment maybe tomorrow at nine. Then you call the parent, maybe the telephone is off or is out of the condition. So you feel you will be having a, a back support, how you can also have someone else who can supplement. So uh, this therapy is very good and very important. And I, I am closing by saying thank you very much for thinking about this action. It's really very, very good. And we hope in the future will be implemented. Thank you very much. And have a nice day. Uh, thank you so much, Bosco. Please don't sign out. Go to the chat and respond to the future, uh, the, the chats that are coming through. People have questions and they would like to hear the answers uh, to those questions. Uh, colleagues, yes. I think we, yeah. uh, I think we are, it's very exciting. 
I would like to note that we have representation from Zambia, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria, and USA in this discourse. And uh, I like that the chats have remained very, very active. And I, I can see even uh, from Kenya, we have representation from the NGO world. Uh, I have seen VSO right in the house. I've seen Crestnet in the house. Uh, I'm very excited to hear uh, Bosco saying that in Rwanda, uh, human inclusion is the one that is supporting the idea of teletherapy. And uh, they're in Kenya. So we're also going to reach out to them and uh, see how we could synergize and how we could leverage on uh, whatever experience they've had in Rwanda so that we can be able to offer uh, the parents uh, better uh, services uh, at this particular time. And we could also uh, see what to do about uh, ourselves, even as uh, service providers. As we come to the tail end of this discussion, allow me to take two minutes to welcome Lauren. Lauren is from... Um, is Lauren still in the house with me? Yes, she is uh, from USA. Uh, she works with therapists beyond boundaries. Uh, she's been here in Kenya with some of us. And I posed a challenge to her and asked, from your experience, Lauren, here in Kenya, and now that we're in the era of COVID-19, uh, and you've listened to the presentation from the context of Africa, where we are, the challenges we are facing. Uh, we have parents who cannot operate uh, technologically driven gadgets, uh, laptops and smartphones. But uh, as uh, Perpetua said, I like that our leaders are getting into this. And I, I was very excited when I heard one of our senators say, maybe we could provide vans that go to the villages and uh, with Wi-Fi and they zo zoom out hotspots for parents to use. And I'm looking at us having this kind of a discussion where we say, let's prepare material for teletherapy and let's go to the different government uh, um, uh, agencies and also go to the different uh, NGOs from the areas where they're operating and we see how we could work together and give services to the parents. Lorraine, what is your advice to us and what do you see as our bigger challenge? In two minutes. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I definitely agree with access being a challenge, not only uh, with the tech access, but I think equipment as well. Um, I think a lot of people are accustomed, like at Kisei, the equipment there is fantastic. And um, they like to go to a place that has everything ready for them that they can utilize. Um, so the vans would be very interesting if they're offering hotspots, if they could be also loaded with equipment, um, whether you know it's more exercise equipment or whether that's toys. Um, I think equipment would be a huge barrier and also looking bigger picture um, and noticing a lot of the chat concerns about parent involvement and taking up more time and more stress from the parents. I think a challenge will be looking at follow through longer term down the road. So not just involvement in that current session because that's requiring more effort from the parents, but I feel and I fear that that would take away from their involvement bigger picture with follow through day to day. Um, you know, really integrating those functional skills moving forward, not just in that therapy session, because now they're having to redirect their time and energy towards that, but making sure that they have the bandwidth to be able to continue that throughout the week, throughout the month, and then adjust, um, continue adjusting as hopefully their, their child or the patient is progressing. You're done? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was fast. Thank you for taking two minutes. Uh, I can see we have participants from Ukraine. We are, we are very excited to have you here. Um, thank you, Lorraine, for giving us that challenge and uh, also um, resonating with what would have, what has been our perpetual fear. Uh, colleagues, I'm looking at this and um, maybe what do the panelists, and I'll give each one of you 30 seconds, what do we uh, advise to be the next point? Do we get therapists together like Perpetua and others, and they prepare some sessions and we put them together and maybe we could run them on CDs and give them to the parents? Do we have therapists 
therapist coming together and we have a YouTube running, knowing very well that uh, we are likely to leave out a big group of our parents uh, without being attended to? Do we get some uh, do we get organizations and government coming together, fundraising so that we could buy airtime uh, on uh, television? Again, um, bearing in mind that uh, our communication authority uh, carried out a survey and said that our homes are not well connected when it comes to TV. The, the biggest connectivity we have in this country, we call them FM radio stations and these are the locally read, uh, run radio stations these are the radio stations that run per what i would call districts in kenya today we are using the word county which is the best way forward so i, I am going to go through all the therapists that have been here uh, you're on my screen lauren i start with you i move to terra then i will move to jackie Bosco and then Perpetua. Uh, so I start with you, Lorraine. What are you giving us as a take home? What is the way forward? Because we can't keep having conversation. We must reach action stage. I think communication with the parents is going to be key um, and really getting their input and having some um, parents. I just saw one of the chat members was offering um, to continue reaching out. Christine, if they needed more input, I think getting some key parents um, that have been through teletherapy and express really what they need um, would be very important. Thank you. Uh, Tara? I agree with Lauren. Um, I really feel it's important to empower parents. Um, sometimes we, we provide services through a model, like an expert model that um, you come to me because I am the expert and I know how to work with your child with disabilities, but empowering parents that they learn and start to gain confidence in helping their child gain skills that therapists can help the parent and the child learn those skills. And I think because the parent is so important in teletherapy. Wow, thank you, Tara empower parents. Parents is very important in teletherapy. I'm sure Christine Mutena is clapping to that. She's a wonderful parent and we always respect and salute her. Jackie, uh, Dr. Jacqueline from Zambia, and if you would put your video on, we would be glad to see your face this afternoon. Yes, well, thank you very much, Lydia. I think uh, just picking up on what you mentioned about, um, you know, actually accessing these services for parents. I think that uh, obviously it sounds to me like within your context, using the radio is definitely one of the best ways. So even as we speak about uh, empowering parents, how can we do that? Um, you know, organizing radio programs that are much more accessible um, to them. But I think that as we move forward with teletherapy, I think there is need to engage the service providers um, to see how they can support um, a lot of the activities that we're trying to do, you know, in the provision of, of, um, of um, our, you know, in the provision of our services. So I think that uh, it's, I feel like it's, we, we need to look at it from a, 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 for lack of a better term, a multi-sectorial approach where you have your therapist, you have the service providers, you have the parents and see how, you know, everybody can work together to make sure that these services are made available. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jackie. Very exciting and we are refreshed to see your face this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to continue engaging. Uh, I know you're giving us food for thoughts, uh, engaging the government. I am sure the team that uh, works with me is uh, already taking notes on that. Uh, Bosco, what do you give us as a way forward from Rwanda? Yeah, thank you very much. What I give you as a way forward, as we have discussed, the teletherapy is so of it for clients and for therapy. Start discussions with the government and the NGO or private companies about the implementation of this action. So it's let's start raising awareness. Maybe. 
the government should be approached maybe through the Ministry of Health so that this uh, kind of, of treatment or of giving therapy to children with disabilities, they understand it, also they support it so that whatever we do, we move on with the government. Once the government is not there, we, we can't go on. So it's very important to start thinking about uh, discussing and uh, raising an awareness and showing them the, the, the importance of ther therapy so that later we start implementing it with the hand in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bosco. Uh, Perpetua from Kenya. Yes, it is very nice to hear uh, great, great feedback. I like Dr. Jacqueline's uh, word, multisectoral. <laughs> that is a yes. new one. I like it. And uh, I, 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 I still support everyone who says the use of uh, government by getting people to partner. So way forward, if I can give a Kenyan perspective, I'm happy that the, the movers and shakers are here in this platform. So <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would like to recommend the, if the video taking is taking place, we need to consider that children are individualistic. So how can we make it very individualistic? Can we have like a group of parents meeting children who have autism? They meet, we, the, the telehealth practitioners come and offer training in regards to the group of parents. And if it's a possibility, the various NGOs, FBOs, CBOs, to get particular training first to the practitioners, the occupational therapist, the physiotherapist, to get first training on how to do a tele, tele, teletherapy practice in Africa. Because I said, we, we are very different, our, our needs, our challenges are different. So how can a, a therapist offer telepractice experience with a Kabambe phone, which I have tried and it has worked. So how can we, Kabambe, sorry for those who are not in Kenya, it's those malls that don't have, the phones that don't have internet. So we, we, can, we can see ways to do it. The radio can be a very important tool for publicity of importance of telehealth. Because now people are, are hearing and saying, what is this telehealth? So the radio is a good one for publicity. Capacity building, both for parents also. We also need to capacity build the parents to be empowered to try it. Anytime I tell you to try something new, you will be like, eh, I don't feel like I want to. So we need to capacity build our parents to be empowered, to feel, oh, let me try this new thing. So that's my take. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Perpetua. And uh, thank you, uh, everybody. At the very tail end of this, allow me to just uh, summarize the, the, what I have picked from our discussion. One, I always like when I hear panelists say parents are very important because sure, parents are very important and uh, they will always be our first line of response. Uh, and therefore, we're talking about empower parents. And uh, as Perpetua has said, maybe we need to get parents of children uh, with a, a one disability and we see how we meet them and create awareness on how to use tele, uh, teletherapy. Uh, we also remember self-care, both for the parents and for the therapist, so that they don't take too much on themselves. As much as Bosco says, teletherapy is beautiful because you don't miss your, your position in the queue, but also the, the therapist could have back-to-back -back work to do if they are doing it uh, live. And therefore, they, they need to take care of themselves. Uh, one big headache we've been left with is how do we determine the cost? And I think we shall be working together uh, <clears throat> uh, with the Perpetua and the Kenyan team that I see is a powerhouse uh, in this uh, sitting. How do we determine the cost? And has, is there going to be cost and who's going to meet that cost? And do we really talk to ins the insurance world so that they can also recognize that uh, telehealth uh, uh, is part of what they should be paying for? Apart from creating awareness, I've had uh, as, uh, echo the importance of government support. So there is need to talk to the relevant government arms. Uh, government also runs some radio stations, some TV stations, who knows? And talk even to telecommunication companies. Maybe they would even give phones, even if it is what uh, Perpetua calls the Kabambe phones. That is where we need to start. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we need to train. We cannot just jump from offering physical therapy services to telehealth and we say we are 
experts. We need to train. We need to retool mm -hmm. the therapist. So uh, there's quite a lot of work to be done around this. But I want to believe that when we shall be meeting for the next uh, round of sitting, we shall have moved a milestone and we shall have moved from words into action. I want to believe that uh, Maria Omari can hear me give her the next challenge that we are moving from uh, words to action. And at this point, it is my pleasure this afternoon to say that uh, as the moderator who has sat and listened to every single word that has been said, I've been challenged, I've been humbled, and I'm very excited uh, that there is uh, a lot that we have gathered this afternoon. I'm very, very humbled by my two sisters from the United States and all the attendees from those countries where the hours were wrong, but you woke up and you joined us. I Allow me to welcome the CEO of uh, the Action Foundation to give us the closing remarks for this uh, particular webinar. Maria. Great. Um, wow, wow, wow. It's been an incredible discussion. I've learned a lot from all of you, and I'm honored that we had representation from a lot of countries in the world. Um, thank you so much to our panelists, Perpetua, um, Jacqueline, Bosco, Tara, Lauren, um, for your insights, and we look forward to the next steps. As Lydia said, it's not all talk, it's about action. We're excited to see what will come out of this recommendation, something for parents perhaps. So I uh, keep it here. We'll share the presentations and the contacts of the panelists with their permission, of course. And yeah, thank you. Have a good day for those who are starting out and have a good evening for the rest of us. Bye and thanks once again. Thank you. Bye.